Sin is a cancerous growth in the soul. It unmans a man. It takes the crown from off his head, the light from his mind, and the joy from his heart. Sin is sadly destructive to man. Sin makes man's body master of his soul. And there's an illustration given. So, this quotation is from Charles Spurgeon in his book, The Power of the Blood. So I want to take my time and break this up for us this morning. Everyone knows what, Jenna, two of us cannot talk at the same time. Every one of us knows what cancer is and what cancer does. Some of us are having and have had personal experiences of cancer. But Charles Spurgeon is saying that sin is like a cancer that eats away at our soul. And it points the soul, not the spirit, not the body in this case. It unmans a man. When he says it on man's a man, it does not, it makes man less than he is. In other words, and I was thinking of this, he does not, does not make man a woman. Although sin is causing man or the male figure to become or try to turn themselves into a woman. And sin is the cause of that. Now, he says it takes, sin takes a crown from off the head. When God created man, he created man to have dominion over everything that was on the earth, including the fowls of the air. But sin again caused man to lose that dominion. Sin causes the light from our mind, the light in the mind. We lost the light in the mind. And then it goes on to add, it takes away the joy from our heart. Sin is sadly destructive. But this one, that he, this statement that he makes, sin makes the body master of the soul. And he gives us an illustration. An illustration of a horse and a man. The law regarding a relationship between, or the relationship between, the horse and the man is that the man controls the horse. The man rides the horse. The man can control the speed of the horse. The man can cause the horse to even back up. But what Charles is saying, he's saying that sin reversed that process. That the horse now controls the man. And if you give that some thought, the horse is impossible for a horse to ride the man, to cause the man to move its speed, to cause the man to back up in a corner. But he's drawing a very deep illustration with very deep meaning that sin has caused everything to be reversed. But again, I want to say this morning, I've heard many a pastor, including our Bible teacher on Wednesdays, the spirit in you and I that is born again cannot be in no way affected by the sin. Could never. It never was, never is, and never will be. The problem has always been in the soul. In the soul. And here it is that because of sin, this body becomes master of the soul. Now we also say that sin is a disorder of the soul. The sin causes the soul to be out of order. You go to the washroom, you see a sign out of order, it doesn't function. You go somewhere, you see a sign out of order, it means that it is not functioning. So what he is saying in the context of what we are speaking about here this morning, that sin has thrown man completely off the track. It's like a train 
that has been derailed. But the news is, there is a cure for the sin that he's speaking about. And the cure for sin has always been blood. I'm not going to say the blood of Jesus as yet. The blood, in the Old Testament, the blood of an animal was used as a covering for the sin. God gave instructions to Moses. And most of the time, a lamb was used as the animal upon the altar that it was sacrificed to cover the sins of the nation of Israel, including the high priest. But then in the New Testament, the Lamb of God, and this is what we need to pay attention to, the Lamb of God was sacrificed, not on an altar in the tabernacle, but he was sacrificed on a cross. And the shed blood of Jesus Christ is the only cure for the sin that has entered the universe. Amen. Amen. There is no other cure for sin. In the Old Testament, the blood of the animal covered the sin. In the New Testament, the blood of Jesus Christ removes the sin. Are you with me? There is no covering in the New Testament. The blood of Jesus removes the sin. It cancels the sin. So we go, my text is Matthew 26, 28. And just look at that briefly. Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. For this is my blood of the new covenant, with the shed for many for the remission of sins. The word remission means cancel. So the blood of Jesus cancels sin. Now we are not speaking about the wrong things that we would do or that we have done. We are speaking about and Charles is speaking about that which we inherited from Adam and Eve. That's why Paul in Romans says, all have sinned and come short of God's glory. Once the sin is removed out of the way, then we are no longer short of the glory of God. All right, I, I want to take my time and see how far I can be able to explain what we want to share with you this morning. Now, Jesus' death on the cross was nothing new. We wear the cross. We have crosses in the churches with all kind of drapes wrapped around it. We have the crosses on the buildings. We have crosses in front. Some of the priests have crosses on their robe on both sides. They have this long garment. The bishops wear this long thing with the crosses. That, for me, I don't know about you, my understanding of this, that cross has no power. Take up a cross and go into a demon possessed is a waste of your time and my time and everybody's time. The cross and my thoughts this morning, what I'm going to share with you, right, is that the only cross I believe this morning that will carry any power is the cross on which Jesus actually died because his blood drained on that cross. And we cannot retrieve that cross because that has long been gone. The Roman Empire used the cross, let me use this word, to bring to a closure the activity of the criminals. So it was a norm at that time for people to die on crosses. The end result of the, the charge is murder. The result is punishment by death, but punishment by hanging on a cross. So Jesus just fell into that situation when they decided they want to treat him as a criminal and hang him on a cross. 
So the cross that you want to put under your pillow can't help you. The cross that you want to put on your windows with the, um, the blue, that won't help you. What you need this morning is the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What you need is the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What you need is the word of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What you need is to be born again by the Spirit of God. Nothing else is going to help you, is going to save you, is going to protect you, except the blood of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, what is the cross? If I were to ask you the question, what is the cross? We look at 1 Peter 18, 1, 18, 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20. And while we are pulling up that, the cross, firstly, is a manifestation. The cross, firstly, is a manifestation. A manifestation means something that is hidden, something that is secret, that is brought out into the light for everyone to see. When we look at the scripture, the text up there, it will tell us that Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world that he would come and die for you and for me. God knew who would be here this morning. He saw the future long before Sunday, 26 February came. He knew how many people was going to be here. He knew how many people will not be here. God is aware of everything because God is omniscient and he knows everything. So where before the foundation of the world, where before Genesis 1-1, when it says in the beginning God created, before God created the world, it was in the mind of the Most High God, it was a plan of God that Jesus would come and die for your sin and my sin and for the sins of the entire world. The word foundation in the Greek tells you before God laid down the foundations of the earth, his plan was to send Jesus in my place and your place. Hear what the word says. For as much as he know, he was not redeemed. And, and I re At several times I went into that word redeemed, I'm not going there this morning. With corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation, there is conduct or behavior in the past received by tradition from your fathers. But with the precious blood, the blood of Jesus is not only powerful, but the blood of Jesus is precious. As of a lamb without blemish, without spot, who verily was foreordained. Ordained before the time. Ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. It is personal. The manifestation of the cross, the manifestation of Jesus' death on the cross is for you. You hear it? Are you hearing me? It is for you. We have a tendency, it's for them. It's for him. It's for she. It's for daddy. It's for mommy. The death of Jesus Christ, the manifestation of this cross, we talk about the crucifixion of Jesus, is for you. It is something personal. It's a personal decision that you would have to make. It's a personal account that you would have to give. Each one of us have to make this personal decision and this personal, we have to give this personal account. Now hear this one. From Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, not verse 1. From verse 2 until the end of Malachi is 4,000 years. From Malachi to Matthew, we talk about the 400 silent years. History, they tell us the dark ages. So we are saying this morning, 4,400 years in man's time, after God began to recreate the earth, it took 4,400 years for Jesus to come and die on a cross for you and for me. Before this 4,400 years, the word says, 
before the foundation of the world. So we don't know how many billions or trillions of years in the plan of God, in the mind of the Most High God, that it was destined, predestinated, before time, foreordained, before time, that God said, okay, son, okay, the word, right? You know, Jesus is the angel of the Lord with the face of Jehovah and so on. He is. The angel that Jacob wrestled with, he was wrestling with Jesus. Get into the word. Study your word. We are hearing that it's only the word of God that will cause our spirit man to grow and overpower the soul. We are hearing that. And we're going to touch a little bit somewhere on that. So first of all, the cross is a manifestation. Secondly, the cross of Jesus we're talking about now is an accomplishment. The cross accomplished something in the life of the human being that nothing else could accomplish. The cross accomplished a spiritual, a mental, and a physical. It was a spiritual, a mental, and a physical accomplishment. We are talking about the death of Jesus on the cross. What Jesus' death did for us, it created that impartation, if I may use that word, to deal with the spirit, an impact on the soul, an impact on the body. The entire triune man, the work on the cross that Jesus did, affected the triune man, every area of our being, our spirit, our soul, our body. Jesus did cause after his resurrection and ascension and the descent of the Holy Spirit. When we accept Jesus as is rightly being taught and said over the ages, our spirit man is renewed. It's born again. One preacher said our spirit was in prison. I will use the term inactive. All right. And I'll, we'll go there in a while. All right. So this morning we're talking about the cross and the blood, but we're not going to go to the blood this morning. We'll touch on that next week, please, God. So we want to deal with the cross and what happened. Death is never an accomplishment. Think about it. Give it some thought. Death. Death, when somebody dies, it's never an achievement. It's not an accomplishment. Death is a defeat. Are you with me? When somebody in the family or the relative dies or somebody in the country dies, that's a loss. But a death with a resurrection attached to it is the greatest accomplishment of all times. And only one person that did so far and only one person will always die. That one person, only one person died and rose again. John 10 and 17 says, Jesus said, I lay down my life. I don't know when we read the word if we pay attention. Now we are hearing on Wednesday nights, those of us that are um, looking on to the Bible study, we just read the word for reading. I will tell you better you don't read. You need to read the Bible and understand. We need to read, we, let me say we, need to read the Bible and allow the Holy Spirit to enlighten us to what is in the Word. Because it is the Holy Spirit who have inspired every word written in the Bible. And nobody could explain or help you and I to understand this word except the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 So Jesus said he had the power. You don't understand who this Jesus is. We really know, we know coming to this place. Jesus said, I. A human being. We saw him. We read. We see movies. A human being said, I have the power to lay down my life and take it up again. So the Romans didn't kill him. The soldiers didn't kill him. The Jews didn't kill him. It was Jesus who laid down his life and he took it up again. Jesus laid down his life because he loved you and he loved me. He came with that purpose. Have you ever stopped the thing? Jesus, as a normal human being, going through life and one day to come, I will have to die. One day to come, I will have to die. 
at 30 years, one day to come, I will have to die. No, I'm going into ministry. It's just for a short time. I will have to die because I am here to die for the sins of these people. And when Jesus died, you and I was nowhere around. But God, but God, but for God's love for you and I, Jesus died in our place. You know why? The penalty of sin is death. And every man born down the loins of Adam and Eve, born in sin, we inherit that. And every one of us is guilty before God. But Jesus said, he will come and die for the human race. He's going to die in our place. One man, one man will die in our place. So we will not stand guilty before God. It is your choice this morning to accept the salvation that Jesus died to give you or your choice to reject that. That's up to you. That's up to you. Thirdly, the cross is a finish. It's done. After the cross, after the work that Jesus did on the cross, after Jesus' death on the cross, you need nothing again. Over the years, we hear so many messages on what was actually finished on the cross, but I'm going to give you this version of it this morning. When the Jews left Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea and they came out. The Lord told them to institute the Passover. The Passover is where they kill the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost and on the lintel. And I look at that as a perfect covering of protection. The two sides and over our heads. And the Lord told them, when the death angel passed, and the death angel sees the blood, he will pass over you. What we have done, I'm not bashing nobody, nor Hillsong, nor Bethel music, nobody, but we have left a lot of the blood songs out of our worship, and out of our private worship. And that's why I love Jimmy Swaggart Ministries. He speaks about the blood. He sings about the blood. The blood still has power. The songs about the blood is still effective. When you're dealing with demon possession, the demon still is afraid when we begin to speak the blood of Jesus. I will talk about that next week. The blood of Jesus Christ has power to keep the death angel outside the house. The blood of Jesus has power to keep the demons outside of our homes and outside of our vehicles and out of the job site. The blood of Jesus is protection for you and I. We need the blood of Jesus. Yes, we need, we speak the name Jesus. And I am saying this morning that we need to start speaking the blood of Jesus. Hear me this morning. As stupid as it may sound, the blood of Jesus washes away our sin. If the blood of Jesus touches the devil, what will happen to Satan? Think about it. The blood of Jesus is so powerful. If it touches the devil, will the devil be saved? Because the blood of Jesus has the power to wash away sins. And the blood of Jesus is the cure for sin. Nothing else. We can bathe with the soap. We can get all the detergents. We can get all the shampoos. We can get all the body wash. We can get what we can. We can go by the sea. We can walk with a calabash. We can walk with flowers. We can walk with coins. Let me tell you something this morning. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing. But the blood of Jesus. We need the blood of Jesus in the now. We need the blood of Jesus. We need to start applying. We need to start pleading. The word is plead. I will come to that next week. What the word plead really means. We need to plead the blood of Jesus over our lives, over our vehicles, over our homes, over the family. The blood has power. Then, the blood has power.
power now and as long as Jesus tarries, the blood will have power. Amen. Amen. So what was finished? The Passover feast lasted about eight days. Every family had to get a lamb. And keep the lamb. We read the scripture. That lamb must not have no one eye or one foot. No spot. It must be a young lamb. One year old. It must be a lamb without spot and blemish. It must be and on the tenth day. You bring that lamb in your home. And you have to let that lamb walk among everybody in the home. The family in the home need to become familiar with the lamb. I am saying this morning that you and I need to become familiar with the lamb, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the lamb of God. Amen, amen, amen. Jesus is the lamb of God. Jesus will always be God's lamb. And we need to become familiar with with the Lamb of God, people. We need to get away from the religious experiences that we have been having. This tradition of being religious and begin to get into relationship. It's too much religious behavior and happenings. We become religious in our worship. We become religious in our prayers. We become religious in how we do services. We need to get away from that. That is not going to do us any good. That is we become just as the other religions. When Jesus died, he died to bridge a gap. He died so you and I can have a relationship with God. And church, we need to move away from the tradition. How we do church, we need to start having relationship with the master. Our worship must be worship type relationship with God. God must be in our worship. God must be in our service. God must be in our having an, an environment like this where we meet together. It is God and God and God and God and God. It has nothing to do with you and I. I keep saying our music must be spirit anointed. Our singing must be spirit anointed. Our preaching must be spirit anointed. Our very lives must be spirit anointed. And you and I know that's not that easy. But we are hearing when we get into the word, the word is really like a mirror. We begin to see ourselves in this mirror, where we are, who we are, and how we ought to function, and who we really supposed to be. We have been saying that so many messages over this period of time. We have been hearing that more or less saying the same thing. So on that day, in the temple, the priest will have thousands of lambs to kill for each family. When it's three o'clock in the evening, he takes up the last lamb and he sacrifices it on the altar. And the priest will see it is finished. What the priest was saying after this lamb there is no more lamb to cut. He takes a lamb, sacrifices, and says, it is finished. No more sacrifices until the next year. You with me so far? While the priest in the temple on that day, it was Passover. We are coming to that. Go back into the world, do some research. Now we have the access to internet and YouTube and so on. On that day, on the cross, while Jesus was on the cross and he was saying it is finished, the priest in the temple was saying it is finished at the same time. But the priest was saying, my job for today is finished until next year. Jesus was saying, there is no more sacrifice to be done after this. It is finished. No more sacrifice. This is the sacrifice that was necessary for the entire human race, not just the Jews. Every person, when we come to this fountain of blood and we access this blood, 
it, whether we are Chinese, whether we are Indians, whether we are Africans, whether we are Portuguese, whether we are Spanish, regardless of whether we are Russians or who we are or what we are, the same blood of Jesus has power to wash away our sins. It is for everybody. Paul said there is neither Greek, nor Jew, nor bond, nor free. We are one. That's why we are one. We need to start functioning as one. I'll tell you this. The same blood that flows in you, flows in me. Once we are born again, it's the blood of Jesus that is in us. We say, Lord, wash me. We don't know what we are saying. Do we understand what we say when we say that the blood of Jesus, come wash me and wash away my sin. Wash away what I inherit from Adam. Wash it away. When the blood washes away that, where does the blood go? What causes the dramatic change in your life and my life? Yes, we are still human. Yes, we still have to deal with the soul. What caused Jesus' death on the cross? When was this really instituted in our time? Can we go to Genesis? We go back to that same scripture in 1 Peter 1 and 20. Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world as a lamb of God. He was God's lamb for us. God's lamb for us. Manifested in these times. Genesis chapter 3. And I want to look at a couple of verses here. And then we'll close it off this morning. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Just look at this. We hear this before. We have heard many messages about this. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which a Lord God had made. What is the meaning of the word subtle? It means sly. The snake was sly. The snake was cunning. The snake was crafty. The snake was ingenious. He could have invented anything. And here the word this morning. This was before Satan entered the serpent. Did God create the snake like that? No. My answer is no. And I charge you this morning, do some research. The serpent developed his own personality. And you and I have the ability to develop our own personality. We that have more than one child in the home, each child is different because each member of the family develops their own personality. Hello? We are not all the same. So the snake had the ability to develop his own personality. And that is what he decided to do. Become a smart man. Become cunning. Become crafty. Right? We know a con man, as they would say. So the personality of the snake was a perfect candidate for the devil. We got to be careful how we develop our personality. The development of our personality can either make us a candidate for the spirit of God or a candidate for the spirit of darkness. Allow me to repeat that. Our personality. You know, we, we hear it and you've seen it now. Church now is not as a couple years before. Everybody have this rebellious spirit. You can't talk to nobody in the churches anymore. You know, we talk to the children in the home when they grown up, and you hear the back answer in the church, people giving you all type of attitudes, including ministers, including pastors, including those who call themselves bishop and apostles. Attitudes, where it comes from, it doesn't line up with the word of God. Yes, we are individuals, yes. But if we have the same blood 
flowing through us. And we have the same spirit that brought us in the body of Christ. Where is the different spirit coming from? That's why we're not seeing revival. That's why we're not experiencing the presence of God. And then we leave the assembly and we go home and church was dead. We never point the finger at us. We always blame somebody else. But what are we praying? Are we seeking God? Are we praying for the pastor? Are we praying for, are we making an effort to help the body? Are we reaching out to help somebody? Are we? When the time to pray, we take it. Now every child has access to the internet. Once you have a phone. And a lot of children, parents that are here, parents who are hearing me, your child is on the internet and without your knowledge and your awareness, they are looking at phone. Phone is available. And when you hear that spirit get in your child, there is nothing you can do to prevent that child from being a runaway horse. Take it or leave it this morning. The attitude of the child changes. The behavior of the child changes. You can see it. And I'll tell you this. You can smell it as well. Because every parent becomes so busy with their own lifestyle and own whatever that we have no time to look at the children. This is one of the most deadly spirits because you entertain a spirit. And let me tell you something from what I've heard other people say, when you get into that, you cannot get out of it so easy. Because it's a spirit that drags you into it. A spirit that keeps you there. Every time you take up the phone or you go to the computer or whatever, that's all you want to go to. People had to really cry out unto God to deliver them from such. If you are young and you are getting into this, you on a wrong path, a really, really bad path. A really bad path. God help us all. That's why some parents, they don't give them phone. And when we don't give you phone, you want to drink poison and you want to hang yourself and you want... I will tell you, go ahead. All right? It's better your body be punished and your soul saved. The personality. Nowadays, younger generation, I'm not bashing anybody. The personality, nobody says good morning. Nobody says thank you. There is no training anymore. And we send the child to the secondary school and we expect the teacher to train them. The teacher is paid to teach your child education. Teach your maths and English and etc. Not to train your child. The training begins at home. But if I, as a parent, am not trained, I cannot train nobody. Oh, y'all want to hear that this morning. If I, as a parent, am not in the right path, I have no say. I have no moral right, no moral authority to tell Mickey anything. I cannot correct Mickey. Nobody say amen to that, but that's a fact. That's the truth. How am I going to train you if I am untrained? I cannot. But I'm going to say this. In, in the preparation of this word, I say this. Every man is the high priest in his house. Every man. And if this man doesn't function as a high priest in his home, in his house. Listen, there's a big difference between a house and a home. The house is the building. The home is the family. How we get along. Everybody come, they go into the room and slam the door. Nobody is accountable to anybody anymore. That's not the plan of God. Get back into the world. Get back into the wood. We say, most of the times, I used to hear my mother saying, wait till your father come. Now you're hear that. The father say, go to your mother. Right? Go to your mother. So the mother has become the high priest in the home. Let me tell you something this morning. With respect to everybody, whether you're on the Zoom, whether you're on YouTube Live, wherever you are, that's not the plan of God. 
God created a man and made the man the head in the home. The man is a high priest. The man is the one to do all the sacrifice. The man is the one to lay down the rules. Yes, we know that there are ladies that are strong-willed. But at the end of the day, if you are in the body of Christ and you read the word and you know the word, you know you need to submit. I left that there. Let me not go further with that. So here comes the snake. Perfect candidate for Satan to use. We could, I could be here doing what I'm doing, talking about this, and I could make myself a candidate for the devil to use. My personality, my behavior, my, oh, we don't talk about attitudes, but attitudes are spirits. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. It's spirit. So I want to move from there. All right? Because God did not create the snake like that. You know why I'll tell you that? When you read the creation account, everything God created, it was good. The only thing that God created and never said it was good was the firmament. You know why? That's where Satan went with his angels. If you dig deep into the doctrine and theology, from the moment God created a firmament, Satan and his angels whoosh up there. That's the second heaven. That's the only thing God didn't say it was good. When he created every animal, it was good. So where did the snake got that from? He developed that on his own. That tells me that each of us have a free will. And that's what I'm saying in Word and Freedom Assembly. We have a free will. As much as I would want everybody to do and operate a certain way, I have to leave you with your free will. That's up to you. You have to decide. It can't be like the wheelbarrow. And it's God going to make all of us like wheelbarrow and keep pushing us around. But God created us with a free will. You're free to choose to serve him when and when not. Now, permit me. Permit me, please. We have gotten so taken up with Zoom meetings, YouTube, Facebook, right? Audio conference on WhatsApp that people don't want to come to church anymore. I have news to you. I am realizing, and my brother is here, there are churches that are going back to the in-house prayer meeting. So when we talk about prayer meeting here, it's not only us. It's not that Michael wants to be something or play something or do something or show up. Or, no, no, no. It's because in my heart, this is what God is saying. Get back on your knees. Get back in the corporate prayer meeting. Pastor Moti had a half-night prayer meeting. We call a half-night prayer meeting. You won't see nobody. Amen. I'll say amen for you. We used to have half-night prayer meeting here. We had half that prayer meeting here. We had three o'clock prayer meeting here. We had five o'clock prayer meeting here. We had six o'clock prayer meeting here. Then we had seven o'clock prayer meeting. Now we have moved from seven and we have put it to 7.30. That's twice for the month now. But these prayer meetings will not just be prayer meetings. We are going to pray and we are going to start laying hands on people. You have a problem, you're sick in your body, Come to the prayer meeting. We pray individually. We pray corporately. And then we are going to lay hands and pray for you. And see God work for you. I challenge you on that this time. See God work for you. Let me move with this. I'll go to verse 3. All right? Verse 3. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, he shall not eat of it. Neither shall. You see that? Did God already say that? Watch this word. Watch this, this. Neither shall he touch it. Did God say that? Sister, can you give me Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17? All right. God never said nothing about touching. Absolutely nothing. So right there, Eve started to lie. So she's making herself a perfect 
candidate. Watch this. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That's the word of the Lord. Can you go back to tree and verse 3? She's telling the devil, Satan, come now, possess the body of the snake, and say, did God say? Did God say? But God said. And when we read the word, or the, when we hear the preacher, or the evangelist, or the apostle, or the teacher, or the pastor, we speak a word. I wonder if that is really in the Bible. Did God really say that? We question that. Did God say? And here it is. Did God say? The devil, did God right away? I wonder, boy. Did God really say that? I wonder. Did God really say that? Did God really say that? She began to think right away. So where, she is, where the point I'm making is what part of the triune being Eve started to function from? Eve started to function from her soul, although she was a spirit being. All right? And you see, when we function from the soul, everything we do, I wonder if I should go to church this morning. I wonder if I should pray. I wonder if I should read the word. We operate them from the soul. And the soul that sinned, it will surely die, so says the word. All right? Yeah, but. But of the fruit, she's telling the devil. But of the fruit, which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, he shall not eat of it, neither shall he touch it. God never said nothing about touch it. What the Lord told Adam, don't eat of all the other trees you could eat. You see this tree here? Do it. The day you eat from that, you will die. And to die, you will surely die. And he did die, and we die. When you read Galatians, it will tell you, in Adam, every one of us die. In Christ, all of us will live. All right? So here it is. She started to lie. Now we go to verse 4. Right there. Verse 4. Tell me, what you say? Did Satan lie? Watch it, good, eh? And the serpent said unto the woman, He shall not surely die. Hear me. The snake is to walk like a man, you know, at that point in time. The snake had a voice. Eve, Adam and Eve will talk to all the animals and they will talk back to them. So the snake talking to Eve was no big thing. Now we will find it was a big thing. But then it was not because there were all the animals and Adam and Eve was to converse. And they understood each other. So the snake talking to Eve was no big deal. You get it? So the snake having a conversation with Eve, she didn't know Satan possessed the body or the snake allowed him entry. So the snake is telling her, the serpent now is telling her, you shall not surely die. Look at the words. Look at the phrasing of that word. You shall not surely die. Right? You die. You die. He's telling the woman, you will not surely die. So that create a different thought in her mind. Next verse. Can we? For God doth know that in the day he eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and he shall be as God's knowing good and evil. Did he lie? Somebody. Did the devil lie? When he told Eve, the day you eat, you'll be just like God. They were already a God. God created them just like himself. So here it is. What it is you telling the woman. All right. The day you eat, your eyes will be open. So she was she blind? No, she wasn't. Which eye will be open? No. When, so she want to be as a God, knowing good and evil. At that time, they didn't know what was good and evil. No, we, we had to suffer with the knowledge of good and evil. Fight, keep fighting off this. Keep fighting off this. All right? 
Now, I want to go at verse 6, and then I want to share something with us. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, I wanted to pay attention to this. The five senses are in our soul. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Am I right? Watch this one. She started to listen to the devil. So she start to use the hear and the ear. Then she start to look at the fruit. She start to use the eyes. Look at here. She took off the fruit. Right? Of course, when you take the fruit, if you get an apple, or a, anybody don't smell something before they eat it, you get food, you just grab it down like that. Don't you smell the food? And then she eat it. Eve forgot who she was, that she was created a spirit being. Yes, with a soul and a body. And in the soul, beloved, there's that part of you and I that says free will. Each one of us have a free will. Eve used her free will to listen to the devil. She used her free will to watch the fruit. She used her free will to take the fruit. She used her free will to eat the fruit. Nobody then force Eve. Anywhere you see in that scripture, the devil said, Eve, take it, take it, take it, take it. Did you see that anywhere? No. He told her, he put it forward to her, and she, all the actions. The devil, we have people with print t-shirts to the back. The devil made me do it. The devil cannot make none of us do anything we don't want to do. I don't care where you hear the devil cause you to do this. God himself, with all the power that he has, cannot force me or you. No we decide to come to church this morning. Others decide they will not be here this morning. Each person made a choice. Hello? Did we make a choice? It was difficult for some of us to get off the bed, but we made a choice. We are here, regardless some folks are not physically well in body, but they made a choice. It's a free will. How many times if I can force anybody to come to church against their will? It will not work. You may come to please me, but you come and swell up. That ain't going to make no sense. Because you cannot serve God with that frame of mind. It must be free will. Whatever we do in this house, it must be free will. Whatever we give in this house, it must be free will. Whoever we help in this house, it must be free will. Whoever we call and talk to, I have been saying, help me call somebody. Help me. Don't let everything from me and Brother Sastry, or Minister Sastry. Call somebody. Check out somebody. Talk to somebody. Help me do the work. Help me to do the work. So she used her soul. She began to operate from the moment she started to operate from the soul and she ate the fruit. She shut down the spirit. According to the teacher on Wednesday night, the glory of God just gone. Listen, don't vex with me this morning. Don't be upset with me. This is my task. This is my job. We can be doing service in the house of God and we can be functioning from the soul. This wouldn't be the best thing to do for us. Nobody, whether on Zoom or YouTube or in person. Hear what the word says. We go back to this word in John 4 and 24. God is spirit. And we, you and I, who worship him, we have to worship from the spirit. The word says that. That's why I will keep encouraging the musicians. 
and I will feel the music. I may not know to play the instrument, but I could tell you when you're in and when you're out. Right? There's something with the music that will cause the people to worship God. Music by itself is not worship. The songs by itself is not worship. Worship in God is a relationship with God. The music and the songs helps us to worship God. Worshiping God is a one-on-one. -on -one. When the tears begin to run down, you know you are in connection with God. It's not man. It's not the worship leaders. It's not the musicians. It's I and God. It's me and God. It's me and God. That's why I see, and I encourage them, try to come before the half nine. If it's five minutes you meet, we used to do that before. We used to meet here before the service start and pray, the worship group. We used to pray before the worship starts. And I want to encourage all of us that are in this group to come before 9, to, to be here at least by 20 past 9, so we can pray together and pray up the place and drive out what needs to be driven out in Jesus' name so we can have that connection with God. I want to say this too. I saw people come in church and they're talking on the phone. Please, you have a conversation, take it on the outside. I'm not telling you not to come to church with your phone and I'm not telling you not to talk, but take it on the outside. But I'll say this too. When you're in class, in your classroom, anybody could make a phone call? Anybody could take a call? Talk to me. When you're in the job, some of you, where you work, your boss say, I don't want to see you with your phone. But why it is you have disrespect for the house of God? Why we do that? Let me tell you this. Those of you that go into school, anybody goes to school without your uniform? Answer me. But we want to come to church dressed anyhow. Right? You cannot go in the court, and that is man's court. Not God's court. You cannot go, ladies, if I still, brother, help me here. They still have to cover their head. You cannot dress any and anyhow. They will put you out. The magistrate will put you outside the court. But we have no reverence. Yes, it's on the house. But this place has been given over unto God. Why we not seeing things happening after we hearing all different types of word and preaching and whatnot is because we decide we want to do we own thing and nobody could speak to us. Minister Sastry doesn't know, but I know he called people and talked to them. He know I know that, but I know that. I'm aware of that. And that's of great help. So there are people who are looking out to help. Why are we not seeing you? We're, not, we're missing you. That choice is yours. You have to make that choice. Listen, the way I dress can push people outside or draw people inside. I don't. How shall one say, say, as I don't there? No, I don't. We have a dress code. You want me to tell you how? No, no, no. We are, not, we are adults. We know how to dress. Let me go down to verse 8, sister. Three, chapter three, verse eight. You know, there is a blame game with the next few verses. I'm coming home with this now. Right? God, you know what? I don't know if you understand what takes place when you read this word. God will come down, almighty, all-powerful God, coming down from heaven to meet man that he created, to communicate and converse with man. Tells us, as we see here, God calling for Adam. Hear this one. There was a particular meeting place, this is how I give you it, that God and Adam and Eve would meet. Did God know what they did? Yes, he knew. 
but he came to the meeting spot to meet with Adam. Where's your meeting spot to meet your God? God is looking for us at the meeting spot. Are we there? Are we at the meeting spot? He's calling. When he didn't see Adam at the meeting spot, he started to call for Adam. Did he know where Adam was? Yes, he knew. He knows where we are. He knows what we are doing. When he comes looking for us at the meeting spot, we cannot force. None of us as ministers, leaders, and pastors could force nobody else to pray. You have to decide to pray for yourself. You have to want to read the word for yourself. You have to want to come to church. You have to, everything is you. It depends on the individual. That's why the individual will stand before him all alone. Pastor Shirley will never be able to answer for me. While I am responsible for she and Mickey and I have to give an account for them, I have to answer for myself. Here with it. They go on hiding. Adam answered. He said, Lord, I heard you. And I was afraid. Adam, why are you afraid? Adam, before when I come calling, you never was afraid. Adam, why are you afraid now? Adam, did you eat? God knew they eat. But you want them to confess. Hello, you're getting it? He want, God wants them to confess. One will say, well, Lord, yes, I eat. But here we start. Why didn't come to church? My father didn't want me to come. Why didn't come to church? My mother didn't want me to come. Why didn't come to church? I wash my clothes. It did dry. I, I don't want to say anything more. You know the excuses we give. Why we didn't want to come to church. Let me tell you something. Allow me to. Let me put it good English. Allow me to share this with you. When we begin to call things on ourselves that does not exist, we are calling things into existence that will come for us and come to us. Say you're sick and you couldn't come to church, you will get sick. Start to blame this and that and you want to come to church. It will happen because we have the power in the tongue. We could speak life or we could speak death and once we begin to understand that word how powerful our speech is we will change how we talk it takes plenty out of me to tell you i'm not feeling well well one person tells me one of my sisters tell me for me time i see your face on the zoom or oh, oh, what she know i i know what and still i won't tell her because i am learning when i say i am sick Look, my brother, there. How are you, how are you, how are you going? He said, Are you going away? He know what I mean. How are you doing? I'm doing good. And I say, Boy, I can't get this man to say nothing else. But I understand what he's saying. Power of speech. Power of speech. I'm realizing that I have the power to speak against the cancer cells, I have the power to speak against the lung infection. I have the power to speak against the kidney infection. I have the power, but I have to develop that power by getting into the word. It's the word, it's the spirit and the word. Did you eat of the tree? He said, the woman you give me. All right, man. How many times we blame the woman? We, we, we men go up. Huh? This little piece of one tell you everything at one time. Use the course. Use the cause why not to go to church. Use the cause and use the cause and use the cause. I did that. So I can tell you about it. Not knowing I am responsible for my own behavior and attitudes. Right? There was, I can tell you a lot. There was a time we was going to church in Barakpo. And I would tell them, drag me when Sunday morning reach. And when Sunday morning reach, I will iron the clothes and hit the shower and then go and sit down in front of the TV. So some of you can't try nothing on me. And then Mickey, I would hear Mickey telling his mother, I tell you here going away. Because when you start staying home, there's a spirit 
that hits you and saps you. Like it bolts you down there. You cannot move again. Because Satan doesn't want you to know the word. He doesn't want you to give your life to Jesus. He doesn't want you to read the word. He doesn't want you to pray. The devil's desire is to chain you there. You with me? All right. Then the woman said, Eve, what you did? God said, what you did? Eve said, the serpent beguiled me. So Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. The word beguiled here, I was asking Pastor Shirley. We read this word and we hear, what does the word beguile? She said, well, use the preacher. She said, you have your phone, check it up. I did. Very simple. It means charm. So the snake charmed the woman. You know, I may go down that road, right? The charm. You know the charm? Eh? Young ladies and young men, we know about the charm. Oh, sorry, by Crystal, I know about the charm. I, I look at that. The snake, imagine this snake. Because of the personality of the snake, the devil had access to his body. There was no other creature that Satan could have used. Because no other creature had the personality that the snake had. So he saw an alignment of like personalities of himself and the snake. You get to know? Right? Let me see what's the next verse. I'm looking for somebody on the crew up in up here. Give me the next verse, sister, if you can. Verse 9. I'm looking at where God tells the stupid. Next one, 10. Please. 11. Watch this one. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? The woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Next verse. Thank you so much. I want to look at the first sentence. If you can, everybody. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this. I want to ask you a question. What it is the serpent did? What the serpent did? Could we blame the serpent? Did the serpent tempt Eve? Hear me good. Did the serpent as a snake all by himself tempt Eve? No. So what is God saying to him? And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, what it is the serpent did? The serpent gave his body for the devil to use to tempt the woman and break the law of God. Nobody cross came in. God said, don't eat. Watch me good. Don't eat. The devil came and crossed the word of God. You see that? That's a cross. God said, from heaven to earth, man, don't eat. That's God's word. Satan came and crossed because he said to the woman, the day you eat, you'll become just like God. You will know he crossed the word of God. God's word was don't eat. He told the woman, you eat and you become like God. You're no good and evil. Now watch this next one. Whenever you read this account, remember this word this morning if you forget everything we have talked about. Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shall thou go and dust shall thou eat all the days of thy life. 
hear me well this morning, all of us. The snake gave his body over to Satan to use. Satan used his body. Did God curse Satan? No. He cursed the snake for giving his body over to Satan to use it to break his law, to cross his word. Watch this next one. God said that what curse above all, so every other, every other animal or created being was cursed at the same time. Watch it, God. Watch your word. Because the snake, the snake gave himself, crossed the word of God, create sin came into existence on the planet then, and everything else was cursed. I'm not going into the curse. I want to close up at verse 15. Verse 15, my sister. Hear what God says now. Because of that, I am going to put enmity, and that's going to be an enemy something, between thee and the woman. That's between the devil and the woman, not the snake. Between thy seed, that's the devil's seed, and her seed, that's the woman's seed. Are you with me? God is going to put enmity. You can't be friends. So when now we are friendship with the world that Satan controls, what are we doing? What are we engaging in? When God said he's going to put a barrier between the seed of the devil and the seed of the woman, and the seed of the woman, which is Jesus Christ eventually, will bruise the head of the devil, and the devil shall bruise the seed. That's the cross right there. When we stop praying, we leave in room for the devil. When we stop engaging and reading the word, we leave in room for the enemy. Fact with me. You can be upset with me. It, it really doesn't matter. But when we fail to assemble ourselves, that's a command. Now, we're not talking about legitimate reasons. I know personally that everybody will not be able to be here every service. But when we deliberately hear my words, deliberately plan not to come to church, that's a different kettle of fish. When the word says, Fail not the assembling of yourselves together in the house. So what are we doing? So when we do that, answer me honestly, but for yourself. We expect God to bless us. What we do it? I told Mickey once, I said, Mickey, and permit me, Mickey. I say, I don't have to curse you. I don't have to speak no word against you. Your actions all by yourself, you can either bring curses upon you or you can bring blessings upon you. You, as members of Word and Spirit Assembly, you decide what you want to do. If you want God to bless you or you want God to curse you. 